we may be on the verge of developing a cure for the deadly virus that causes AIDS. Earlier this month, British researchers announced AIDS patient in London had become the second person in history to be free of the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. And as we speak, there may already be a third. We will speak to reporters, health experts, and those on the front lines about what this means in the four decades long battle against AIDS. Hello, welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren. Now, it was once a guaranteed death sentence, and then in 1996, a new medicine came along. Did not cure AIDS, but if you could get the medicine, it meant you could live with HIV. But now, there may be bigger news. Researchers in Britain may have finally found a cure for AIDS, which worldwide has killed 35 million people. Now, although recent advances in treatment have made it easier for AIDS patients to control the disease, the stigma with the deadly virus remains. But as VOA's health reporter Carol Pearson reports, there is renewed hope for millions after this news this month that a second AIDS patient, 12 years after the first patient, has been deemed HIV free. Scientists have been searching for a cure for HIV AIDS for close to 40 years. Those leading the fight against AIDS at the UN called the news that a British man has been functionally cured of HIV a breakthrough. The breakthrough gives us great hope for the future, but also shows how far we are from the point of ending AIDS with science, as well as the absolute importance to continue to focus on HIV prevention and treatment efforts. The London man is HIV free after receiving a stem cell transplant from a donor with a rare genetic mutation, one that made him resistant to HIV. The patient is now off HIV treatment. We waited 16 months before stopping uh, in the post-transplant period just to make sure that uh, the, the cancer was in remission, uh, the patient was well, and uh, that the measures we had of the HIV reservoir in, this, in the body uh, showed that there was very, very little virus there, if, if any at all. Gupta hesitates to call it a cure, but he says it's significant. This is the second patient to show no sign of the HIV virus after a similar stem cell transplant. The first was an American man treated in Berlin 12 years ago. If you transplant those cells into somebody who already has HIV, you may protect those new cells from, from infection. But stem cell treatment is not a practical cure for the 37 million people across the globe who have HIV. It's expensive, and finding a match with that genetic mutation is difficult. The procedure itself is painful and risky. Having a bone marrow transplantation is a very complicated process. It, it requires an entire new set of cells to be taken into, a, into the person who's having the treatment. And that, again, is a process where whilst those cells are embedding, you're very at risk of getting infections and potentially dying. Both the London and Berlin patients had cancer and had no other choice but to take that risk. The second success has fueled optimism. We now have reason to believe that the Berlin patient was not a one-off case, meaning it is possible to nearly or maybe even completely eliminate HIV from the body of an infected person. Scientists will continue to search for other ways to cure HIV, but now they know it can be cured, or at least put into remission. Our health reporter, Carol Pearson, is here with us. Carol, um, I said that we're on the verge of a career, of, of a cure of this, but that's overstating a bit, isn't it, based on the, the fact that the people who are now HIV uh, free had very unique circumstances. Yes, it is overstating it. First of all, there's a third case, possibly, in Dusseldorf, Germany, and which the, the patient has been off his antiretroviral therapy for about three months. But it, the doctors are hesitant to say whether it's he's cured or whether the London patient is cured. They may only be in remission with their HIV. However, their cancer seems to be cured. So. This is actually a cure for cancer. You have to be healthy enough to sustain a stem cell transplant. You have to find a tissue donor who's a match. And then you have to look for essentially a needle in a haystack, which is the genetic mutation that prevents someone from getting HIV. So after the 
transplant, if it's successful, the patient's blood will match the donor's blood and they will be HIV free or HIV resistant. Uh, we've heard that it's extremely risky and your guest following me, Dr. Fauci, could explain that better because it puts you at risk for all sorts of immune uh, opportunistic diseases that can attack you while your, your immune system is low. Well, even if this were, if we were so fortunate to have this as a cure, it's, you know, it's such a, an ordeal that with 37 million people affected worldwide, it seems that it, it would be an, an impossible delivery. Yes, 37 million people affected. If they are on antiretroviral therapy that will suppress their HIV viral load to the point where they can't pass it on. Well, then, and, and that's and, easier. And take that, it, that's easy. Day. That's easy. But you have to take it. And that's the complicated part because we're all human and we all forget our medicine. Um, so, but what it does show is that perhaps with this genetic mutation, there could be some possibility of manipulating the virus to fool it, you know, so that you can cure it and people don't have to be on therapy every single day of the, for the rest of their lives and can still lead normal lives. That's, you know, way off in the future is, of science. Is there a way to describe the reaction from the research community? Obviously, you know, when you read this as, you know, as a, as a non-researcher, research non-medical, you're, you're, you're extremely hopeful. Um, is the research community excited about this? UN AIDS said that they welcomed this. Some people are very excited about this because it shows what the possibilities could be. However, right now, you can end AIDS as we know it by keeping people who have HIV on their medication, by using uh, Truvada, a medication, to prevent people who are at risk of getting HIV from getting it, by using safe sex and they're working on a vaccine that if it's proven effective, could effectively end AIDS. But the question is finding people who normal people can't remember to take their medicine every day, people who have HIV are the same as us. Um, and if you're an IV drug user, you may not be able to remember to do it every day either. So you have to find, you have to use all of these and perhaps better is a vaccine against Wait. HIV. Carol, thank you. The HIV AIDS epidemic did not become part of our medical lexicon until about four decades ago when the first cases were reported by health professionals. June 1981 saw the first reported cases of AIDS when the CDC published an article about a rare lung infection involving five previously healthy men suffering from weakened immune systems. By year's end, the number of individual cases had risen to 337, all of them men. 130 would die from the as yet unknown disease, which some publications had begun calling gay men's pneumonia. In 1982, the CDC coins the terms AIDS for acquired immune deficiency syndrome. The same year, Congress introduces legislation allocating funds for AIDS research. The first case of AIDS in women is reported in January 1983. By May, French researchers announced the discovery of the retrovirus believed to cause AIDS. By then, the mystery surrounding the virus, which would later be identified as the Human Immunodeficiency Virus, or HIV, had started to create fear and resentment among the general public. In September 1983, a New York physician is threatened with eviction after he treats patients with AIDS initiating the first lawsuit against AIDS discrimination. Two years later, 1985, American President Ronald Reagan mentions AIDS publicly for the first time when his administration is criticized for underfunding AIDS research. By year's end, the United Nations reports cases of HIV infection have been identified in every region of the world. Two years later, in March 1987, the FDA approves the first medication to treat AIDS, a drug initially developed to treat cancer. In 1988, the U.S. bans discrimination against federal workers with HIV. Despite major advances in treatments, the 1990s would see a substantial increase in the number of people infected with HIV, more than three and a half million people each year. 
By 1997, new diagnoses are declining, but the number of people dying from AIDS continues to rise, hitting a peak in 2004 and 2005 of 2 million deaths each year. Since then, the annual number of deaths has declined steadily. The first known cure is reported in 2008, when a man undergoing treatment for leukemia receives a bone marrow transplant from an HIV-resistant donor. In 2019, a second person is cured in London using a similar procedure. And there are new reports that a third patient in Germany has been effectively cured and is now HIV-free. So could scientists have finally discovered the breakthrough that millions around the world have been hoping for? Health experts say, not so fast. For more on the science behind the recently reportedly cured HIV patients and just where we are in the race to eradicate HIV and AIDS, we are joined by Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Fauci has made major contributions to HIV AIDS research and has advised five U.S. presidents on HIV AIDS. Dr. Fauci, nice to see you. And when we talk about prevention, it seems to me there are two things. Prevent you from getting the HIV virus, and then once, if you do get the HIV virus, to prevent it from turning into AIDS. Um, tell me, where are we on, or not we, I guess you, on finding a vaccine? Well, a vaccine work is going on right now, uh, you know, in a pretty aggressive way in the sense of a lot of very good people working on it. We had years ago shown that a vaccine was modestly effective, but not good enough for prime time. So right now there are two major vaccine trials going on in Southern Africa, the results of which will get probably mid-2020, beginning of 2021. So a lot of good work going on, but really nothing yet that we can implement in a big way. What is the challenge to finding a vaccine for HIV? The challenge with finding a vaccine for HIV is that unlike any other virus that we've ever dealt with, the body naturally does not make a very good response against natural infection. If you look at all the diseases, the killers and maimers historically, that we've successfully developed a vaccine against, most people generally recover from those infections, be it polio or smallpox or measles, and then the body makes a response to protect you from getting reinfected. So we already know the body is capable of making a response. So to make a vaccine, you really need to, in a safe way, mimic, vaccine, mimic natural infection with the vaccine. Not so with HIV, because the body for reasons that are very complicated, does not make a very good response against the virus. So we have to induce a response that not even natural infection is capable of doing. So that's a pretty high bar. We're trying for it, but it's still a very high bar. Well, President Trump this year at the State of the Union brought up uh, HIV AIDS. Um, here's what he said. Scientific breakthroughs have brought a once distant dream within reach. My budget will ask Democrats and Republicans to make the needed commitment to eliminate the HIV epidemic in the United States within 10 years. Dr. Fauci, um, he says the dream is in reach, and, and I hope he's right. Um, is the United States making a significant contribution in terms of financial contribution to getting it done, or, you know, or do we need to spend more money on this? Well, I mean, obviously, greater resources would help, but right now we're spending an extraordinary amount not only on the research itself, but on the implementation. If you look globally, the PEPFAR program, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, started by President George W. Bush and continued throughout the Obama and Trump administration, is responsible for saving now well over 14 to 15 million lives globally, together with the Global Fund. What President Trump was talking about in the State of the Union address was a plan that we at the, at the Department of Health and Human Services have put together that models the plan in a way that if we can get people who are infected on therapy, that would not only save their lives, but prevent them from infecting others and use prevention modalities, such as pre-exposure prophylaxis for uninfected individuals, theoretically, we could end the epidemic as we know it in the United States, because the epidemic in the United States 
is not a diffuse epidemic. It is highly concentrated on certain demographic and geographic hotspots. It's very interesting that we have 3,007 counties in the United States, and 48 of those counties, plus the District of Columbia and San Juan, Puerto Rico. So 50 locations account for more than 50% of all the infections in the United States. So if we could focus on those areas and then distribute it beyond that later on, we feel that within 10 years, we could, we could decrease the number of new infections by 90%. And in effect, that would be ending the epidemic as we know it, because we have very good therapies right now. Well, once you uh, once you get the the virus or get or get AIDS, um, you know, of course, you want the cure. You, what is your reaction to the news out of London, and of course, the, also the news 12 years ago about someone supposedly being cured? It seems rather right. complex, and and both patients had cancer. But what's your reaction to those reports? Well, you know, I have been very uh, public about my reaction. I think it's it's an important proof of concept, and the proof of concept is that there is this receptor that the virus uses to infect a person, a, reception, a receptor on my cells, on your cells, on everyone's cells. The transplants that were performed, the donor had a genetic mutation that made that person resistant to infection. So when they transplanted the stem cells, both to cure the underlying neoplastic process the person had, but also then making that person resistant to the virus replicating. Hence, that's a cure. But as Carol Pierce said, and as you had said, this is not a practical way to cure an individual. It's a proof of concept that if you manipulate that receptor in a safe, scalable, and inexpensive way, that may point the way forward for the next several 10, 15 or so years. But the thing that I have been speaking about, and I actually wrote about it just recently in the Washington Post editorial, is that there's another challenge that we have that's even more immediate. We have excellent therapy and excellent ways to prevent infection. Our challenge now is to implement that with the people that are not yet on therapy, that could benefit from therapy, and people who are at risk that could benefit from pre-exposure prophylaxis. If we accomplish that, that would be the real breakthrough. If they're not on therapy, is that uh, because they don't know that they have the virus and that they're at risk of spreading it to others? You know, that's a very good question, Greta. And the fact is about 14 or 15 percent of the 1.1 million people in the United States that are infected do not know that they are infected. The overwhelming majority, about 80 to 90 percent of all the infections that are transmitted are by people who either don't know that they are infected or they do know they're infected, but they're not in adequate care, so their virus is not suppressed, which really gets us to make the point that it's a true point, that if you identify everybody who's infected and put them on therapy, get them in care, and get the virus to below detectable level, you could essentially stop all infections because no one would be infecting anyone else. So it's really an implementation challenge that we have here. And that's what the plan is all about. Dr. Fauci, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Good to be with you. And HIV AIDS is a global issue. Here's a look at the prevalence of HIV around the world, a snapshot of the hot spots for HIV infections. According to the World Health Organization, Nearly 37 million people were living with the HIV virus in 2017. And since 1981, 35 million people have died from AIDS. Although HIV infections are a global problem, Sub-Saharan Africa has one of the highest infection rates in the world. HIV hotspots include Eastern and Southern Africa, where 19.6 million people are currently living with virus, in Western and Central Africa, it's 6.1 million. Another hot spot is India, where 2.1 million people are infected, followed by Latin America with 1.8 million. There are 1.7 million cases in the United States, 1.4 million in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, 500,000 in Western and Central Europe, 310,000 in the Caribbean islands, and 220,000 HIV cases in the Middle East and North Africa.
the almost 40 years since the discovery of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, scientific advancements and medical breakthroughs have taken the disease from a guaranteed death sentence to a manageable illness. Joining us to talk about the reality for those living with HIV, CDC-trained medical epidemiologist and founder of Promoting Practical Health, Inc., Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick joins us. Nice to see you. Hi, how are you doing? Okay, so um, tell me, um, not to scare everybody, but um, how do you know if you have HIV virus? That is an excellent question. First, let me thank you for doing, um, doing this show because we need to educate people about this disease so that they know what they're looking for. Some people don't know they're infected with HIV because you can't feel anything and you can't see anything. Sometimes it takes up to 10 years or more for people to have symptoms Even of in HIV. In the 10 years, can you infect others? You absolutely can. You can infect people pretty close to the time that you become infected. So it's really important for people to be able to recognize when they may have been in a situation that put them at risk for HIV. And HIV is largely sexually transmitted nowadays. If you have the HIV virus, does that necessarily mean that you will develop AIDS? No, it doesn't. And as Dr. Fauci mentioned, we have great treatment for HIV now. And if, if you we, know you have it. If, we, if, we, if you know you have it and we catch the infection early enough, no one ever has to develop AIDS. So those people who develop AIDS, it's because they either were not tested, they tested late, or they found out they were positive and they didn't go on treatment. So the message is get tested for HIV because there is great treatment that's very well tolerated now. It's not like the 80s and 90s when people were dying of AIDS. You don't have to die of AIDS in 2019. And, and exactly what is AIDS? It's a, an immune, pro, immune system problem? The, so the virus destroys the immune system. And the reason you need your immune system is to fight off infection. So you might get pneumonia, for instance, you because might you can't fight that off? All kinds of infections. You can get pneumonia, you can get kidney infections, brain infections, skin infections. But again, it's not necessary to get to that point. We need people, especially people like me, doctors and nurses, to test people for HIV so that we can offer them treatment so that they don't have to develop AIDS. And I think there's a misconception that even if, you, if you've, di you've been diagnosed with AIDS, once you have AIDS, you're always going to be at risk of dying. That's not true. Is okay, the treatment, um, is the treatment that's out there, um, tru Truvada, is that how you pronounce it? The tru uh -huh. is it? Is that a treatment for HIV or is that a treatment for AIDS? It's both. So, and we'd like to say it's treatment for HIV. So, the tre so when we talk about AIDS, and this is an important distinction, AIDS is just a term we've used to signify that the HIV is out of control and it's really impacting your immune system. Now you can't fight anything. AIDS is, an HIV virus has gotten to the point where you can't naturally fight off all these other problems. Right. But even if you have AIDS, the treatment can control the virus and people live a normal life, even, ha even after being told they have AIDS. Right. Two questions on the treatment. Um, number one, how expensive is it? And um, you know, how easy is it? Is it a pill, is it a shot? But uh, first tell me the cost. The cost varies and it depends on your insurance, but the good, the good news is, at least in the United States, treatment is covered by insurance. And in a lot of places, the cost of the medication has become affordable so that people, even in developing countries, can afford it. So if I'm living on the continent of Africa mm -hmm. and I suspect that I have HIV, I get tested, I find out I have the virus, it, you say it's affordable. Um, any thought on what affordable means? Because that's a sort of a wide range depending on who you are and your means. Well, there, there are arrangements that have been developed and a lot in part because of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief and the Global Fund. Treatment is available, but not everywhere. So it's hard to say exactly how much the treatment will cost from country to country. But the, the point is, there is treatment available and people can access it. Unfortunately, not everyone in the world has access to it yet, but hopefully and, we'll get there. And is treatment one pill a day or one shot a month or, or what is it? Because some people get sick of taking pills. Yeah. When we, when we first learned about HIV, people had to take a handful of pills. 
But now you can take one pill a day or even two pills a day to... For the rest of your life, though. For the rest of your life. For right now. But once we, once we advance science, which I really hope we will, and I think there's good news about what we're learning about HIV, maybe one day people won't have to take medicine for the rest of their lives. But for right now, yes, you have to take the medicine every day. It, you know, a lot of people think this is a gay man's disease, but it can be passed from mother to child, pregnant mother, can a pregnant mother pass it to her child? Yes, but testing is so critical, and it's important to talk about testing because if you find HIV early, you can interrupt transmission, and this is so vital for mothers who are pregnant, which is why the recommendations are to test any mother who is pregnant the time you find out she's pregnant, you can test her. You can also test throughout the pregnancy. And if a mother hasn't been tested during pregnancy, you can test her during labor and delivery so that you can intervene to protect the baby. So my point, it's not just one demographic uh, that's, that's vulnerable to this HIV virus. It, it's spread to men, women, um, all ages. That, and that's, that was the point that I was trying to make. Um, is, um, is the test, what's the test? Is it, a, is it an expensive test? The, the tests are also covered by insurance, but if they're not, um, you can get the test in the store, in the, in the drugstore. You don't need a prescription, or you do need a prescription uh, in no, the United States? You, no, you don't, you don't need a prescription, but most people are tested in the medical setting. So it's either a blood draw or a mouth swab to test for HIV. But this issue of testing, I can't emphasize it enough. We are not testing people enough to identify everyone who has HIV. All right, we've talked a little bit about the training of doctors. I mean, are doctors and nurses and healthcare workers, are they, they're keeping their eye on this and are, are, they, are they spotting this in their, in their offices or on the, wherever they do their care? Not enough. I gave a, a presentation for a group of doctors a couple years ago. And I asked how many of them were routinely testing for HIV, and only a few hands went up. So we are really behind in getting healthcare providers to help us and do our part in addressing the epidemic. And we only have about 30 seconds left, but um, the stigma has also gotten in the way of, of a lot of people getting help. Isn't that right? Very much so. People are ashamed. When I first started treating people with HIV, I had a nurse asking me if she was going to die of AIDS. Two weeks ago, I had the same question asked because people are not talking about this infection. Doctor, thank you very much. Before we go, I want to acknowledge the brave journalists in Sudan. In recent weeks, several journalists have been detained in Sudan simply for covering protests against the country's longtime dictator, President Omar al-Bashir. Now, the Committee to Protect Journalists, or CPJ, has reported that several Sudanese journalists have been arrested since the anti-Bajir protests flared up this past December. One journalist, Osman Mirghani, editor-in-chief of the independent Sudanese newspaper al Tayyar, was arrested February 22nd at the paper's headquarters in Khartoum by agents of Sudan's Federal Intelligence Service. According to the CPJ, Sudanese authorities have not stated why Mirghani was arrested, nor where Mirghani is being held. The CPJ also reports that since the beginning of the anti-Bashir protest, the al Tayyar newspaper has been operating under a strict censorship regime by the Sudan government. The Committee to Protect Journalists has renewed its call for the release of Osman Mirghani and for the government to end the injustices against journalists in Sudan. And we have plugged in, likewise call for his release and the release of all the journalists detained in Sudan. That's all the time we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice America. And you can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta. And do follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thanks for being plugged in.